On this, the 527th day of 15 days to slow the spread, the leader of the formerly free world, Dr. Fauci, is finally offering guidance on when we will finally have slowed the spread and flattened the curve and will be able to get back to normal life. I've got the answer for you. Just one more year. I do want to ask you something about you, the, that you said to NPR today. You said if the majority of Americans get vaccinated, quote, mm. we could start to really get some good control over this as we get back into the fall of 2022 right. a year from now. Is that the best case scenario? And what does control look like? No, you know, I, you know, I, uh, Anderson, I have to apologize when I listen to the tape. I meant to say the spring of 2022. So I didn't misspeak. And in the conversation with Mary Louise Kelly, she was saying, when do I think we're going to start to get some control? I said, if we can get through this winter and get really the majority, overwhelming majority of the 90 million people who have not been vaccinated, vaccinated, I hope we could start to get some good control in the spring of 2022. I didn't mean the fall. I misspoke. My bad. Oh, his bad, his bad. It's not going to be a full year. It's just going to be a little more than half a year. And boy, is that a relief, you see, because I, I thought it would be a year before we could get back to normal. Instead, it's just going to be 207 more days for a total of 734 days to slow the spread, which is just shy of 50 times as long as they initially told us that it would be before they changed that prediction a bunch of times. But I bet they're telling the truth this time, right? I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday from Lewis Fishman, who says, we haven't lost any equipment. There it is. It's right there where we abandoned it in Afghanistan. That's true. That's true. You can't, this was actually the point I made in my column on Afghanistan. You can't lose a war that you never set goals to win. <laughs> so you can't, you can't lose if you, if you set out to lose in the first place, right? Then you sort of win when you lose. We all lose when big tech companies spy on our data, which is why I would strongly recommend ExpressVPN. I do not go online without a VPN, okay? What is a VPN? A VPN is a simple app for your computer or smartphone that encrypts all your network data and tunnels it through this secure server so that your ISP, your internet service provider, cannot see any of your activity. When I go online, I go online with ExpressVPN, the best out there. That's just what I do. If the NSA spying on Tucker Carlson (laughs) didn't convince you of this, then I don't know what will, okay? So much of our lives now are on the internet. People are looking at what you're doing. They're trying to get your data, okay? I recommend ExpressVPN as the best way to hide your online activity from your ISP. You just download the app, tap one button on your device, and you're protected. I know a lot of people don't think about this wake up. Every, we are living in the age of surveillance capitalism. Everyone is trying to get your data. Stop handing over your personal data to the ISPs. Protect yourself with the people that I trust. EXPRESSVPN.com slash Michael to get three extra months for free. Go on over expressvpn.com slash Michael right now to learn more. How much longer is Dr. Fauci going to be able to keep up this charade? The answer is for as long as people believe him. And I'm sure, obviously, if you're listening to this show, you probably do not believe Dr. Fauci very much because he has lied, because he has been wrong, because he has misled on many occasions for over a year now. But just that number, how do people get over that number? 15 days to slow the spread. Oh no, another month. Oh, another two months. Oh, another one more season. Oh, one more just one more, just one more, just one more. It's going to be over two years by the time this is all done. And probably more than that. I don't know why we would believe that it'll only be two years now. They have radically extended the timeline again and again. You see, Fauci, he doesn't want to. He doesn't, he respects people's freedom. But the other thing that you just mentioned now is they're going to give a lot of incentive and backing for a lot of institutions and organizations and places of employment to mandate. And that could be colleges, university, the military, organizations that employ a lot of people. Some of the big corporations are going to say, 
If you want to work for us in person, you've got to be there and get vaccinated. And I think that's a good thing. I know I respect people's freedom, but when you're talking about a public health crisis that we've been going through now for well over a year and a half, the time has come, enough is enough. We've just got to get people vaccinated. Enough is enough, you peasants. I respect your freedom, but when politicians use the word but, almost always they do so to negate whatever they have just said. I was, look, look, listen here, you. I respect your freedom, but I don't. Ha ha ha. Gotcha. Dr. Fauci. <laughs> This jerk, this jerk, uh, why he is permitted to pontificate after being wrong on so many things and admitting to lying about other things, like the masks, right? He said, well, the reason I said that the, that the masks don't work is because I wanted to save masks for the people in the hospitals. So he's saying, it's not, I thought there would be a shortage, right? He's, he's not saying he said the masks wouldn't work because he thought the masks wouldn't work. He's saying, I said the masks wouldn't work because I wanted to save them for people who I would prefer to have have them. A lot of people are, are pointing this out. I mean, I've mentioned this before, how he has no credibility. But in, as a political matter, this is actually probably a strength for Fauci. If Fauci just stuck by his story for the entirety of the lockdowns, then it would be very easy to prove that he got things wrong. But that's not what Fauci does. That's not how he operates. That's not how he's operated since the beginning of his career, going all the way back to AIDS. Fauci holds virtually every side of every issue at some point so that he always will have gotten something right. He'll have gotten everything else wrong, but he'll have always gotten something right. If he's constantly changing, then you can't just look to the science. You can't just look to the data. You can't just look to some principle. You just look to his whims, his caprice. That's, that's the, I mean, this is what demagogues do. They take away your attention from some objective truth or some principle, and they just put it in their own will. And Fauci's will is going to extend this for now, at least another, what, seven, eight months, probably more than that. So, of course, people are making comparisons to tyrants. And yes, people are comparing Fauci to Hitler and to Nazis. Now, I I don't generally make Nazi comparisons because I, I find that people only make those comparisons because they don't really know anything else about history. So they'll say, when, you know, Trump is Hitler, it's because they don't, they don't know anything about any historical event other than World War II. And even that they probably don't know very much about, but they, they've at least heard the name Hitler. So they say, you're like Hitler, but there are other historical events. So I, I generally don't make the Nazi comparisons, but Dr. Fauci is very upset because people are comparing him to 20th century tyrants. How do you feel when you hear Republican state lawmakers in Maine and elsewhere, and we played a clip a moment ago, comparing public health officials, scientists such as yourself, doctors trying to get Americans vaccinated? to Nazis, to Joseph Mengele, talking about Nuremberg trials and more? I think it's completely crazy. Uh, I mean, anybody who has any common sense and looks at that and sees what they are doing, uh, the same people that are saying it's being like a Nazi to try and get somebody to do an intervention that would save their life, at the same time that they're jumping around grabbing ivermectin and getting toxicity from it. It's just bizarre, matey. Totally bizarre. Totally bizarre. It's so irresponsible to compare anyone to a Nazi, especially after we just had President Hitler Trump, right? Especially after George W. Hitler that we had before him. I I just don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear any complaint about Fauci being called Hitler or a Nazi or Mengele or whatever. The left almost exclusively compares <laughs> Republicans to Nazis. They, they did it, obviously, for the entirety of Trump. People forget now they did it for the entirety of the George W. Bush administration. They did it to Reagan. So I just don't want to hear it. Sorry, I don't care. I don't care about Fauci's feelings. I don't care about his expertise. I don't care about his political power that he's maintained for, what, five decades now or something? Four decades? He is a jerk. <laughs> He's a jerk. No one should believe him. No one should follow his advice. He should be fired, but he probably won't be. 
He probably won't be because these guys have power and they're going to wield it. Bill de Blasio in New York has summed this up. He summed up the left's approach to you, your society, your rights, and your way of life. He was asked about the mandates. So, you know, you'll remember when the vaccine first came out, de Blasio was just offering all these goodies to people to get it. He's, he offered them cheeseburgers. He said, if you got to, he was eating the cheeseburger live in person. It was disgusting. He was there. Was, mm, oh, wow, good cheeseburger. Mm. Now stick yourself with the experimental drug. I mean, I'll give you cheeseburger mm, and french fries. Mm, mm, it was so gross. Uh, so that was the, that was the carrot. Then he's offering the stick, which is you're going to be punished if you don't get it because there's a mandate. And this is, this is not just his theory on COVID. This is his theory on human nature. Look, human beings do well when they have carrot and stick. So uh, a mandate helps people to realize it's time. FDA final approval on Pfizer said it's time. Now, the Biden administration could do something else that would really help us all move forward, speed the approval of the vaccine for the five to 11 year olds. It's time for that. It's time. It's time. It's just time for that. We pretended that you had freedom for a while, but now it's time. The, the jig is up. Okay. And we need to follow the science, which is why I, a politician, am pressuring scientists to speed up the approval of the experimental drug for children, even though children face very, very low risk from coronavirus because of the science. And because anyway, forget the science, the jig is up, just do it. Carrot and stick. This is what these people think of you. They don't think that you are a person to be persuaded. They think you are an animal to be bribed and goaded and prodded. That's, it's not just de Blasio who thinks that. It's Fauci, it's Biden, it's the entire liberal establishment. And unfortunately, they've got the power, so very often it works, whether we like it or not. If you want to protect yourself from these sorts of things, I would strongly recommend you check out Ring. We got some holidays coming up. We got Labor Day coming up, looking past that Columbus Day, Thanksgiving even, not too far into the future. People might be coming to your house and you're probably going to want to know who's at the door when they come a knock. And that's why I would strongly recommend Ring alarm. Go to ring.com slash Knowles right now. Ring will allow you to see and speak to whoever is on your doorstep, whether that person is the delivery guy or the milkman or the burglar, or maybe it's your in-laws coming in for the holidays. And maybe you're going to react differently depending on who is at that door. Okay, I'm not saying how you're going to react. I'm just saying maybe it's good to know that sort of stuff, whether you're in your house, whether you're at the office, whether you are on a beach on the other side of the world. Protect your home with Ring Alarm. Easy to install. You can keep an eye on every inch of your house with their terrific equipment. Protect your home anytime, anywhere. Ring Alarm, ring.com slash Knowles. You get a special offer on a Ring Alarm security kit today. Build a system that's right for your home. Have it up and running in minutes. That's ring.com slash Knowles, ring.com slash Knowles. We are seeing a national disintegration here. It's well beyond Afghanistan. Okay, I think this is one of the arguments for the people who said, why are we still in Afghanistan? One of the arguments really had nothing to do with Afghanistan. It had everything to do with the home front. We no longer have faith in our elections. Neither the Republicans nor the Democrats, don't forget. Sure, Trump right now is still saying, and a lot of Trump supporters are saying, that the election in 2020 was rigged. You're not, I think you're not allowed to say that anymore on social media, which kind of shows you some of the problem. Uh, but d- Democrats have been saying that the 2016 was rigged from the beginning, including Hillary Clinton, including the, the vanquished candidate. We've had increasingly little, little faith in our election, I suppose decreasing faith in our elections over the past several cycles. We no longer trust our other established institutions beyond the elections. We uh, just saw leftist militants uh, burn city after city after city last year. We have lost our rights to go to work in many places, our rights to go to church in many places, our right to go to the restaurant in in many places. Increasingly so now. We're we're seeing uh, less and less faith in our fellow citizens. No one trusts that Joe Biden is even awake at this point. So no one trusts that we have a properly functioning president within the constitutional order. Even Democrats don't trust that. They believe that the kind of bureaucracy and establishment is running the show, which it, which it is, obviously. No, no, no one believes that Joe Biden is, is capable at this point of sitting in the Oval Office and making sophisticated grand strategic decisions about the country. Even if, he, if this were him making that, it would, it would actually prove the point all the more looking at what's happened in Afghanistan, looking at what's happened on the economy, looking at what's happened 
all over the place on coronavirus for that matter. The New York Times comes out with a piece. They say how the Taliban turned social media into a tool for control. See, Tal- Taliban, obviously, obviously very bad. Afghanistan, very, very bad place. No one's disputing that. But they don't seem to be able, they can see what's going on overseas. They can't see what's going on in our own country. So in the 1990s, the Taliban banned the internet. Now they use it to threaten and cajole the Afghan people in a sign of how they might use technology to build power. Yeah, it's just the Taliban doing that, right? Right. No one else is using social media as a tool for control. Social media, the big tech companies, weren't actually just built as a tool for control, as a tool of surveillance, capitalism, and behavior modification. That's not actually their entire raison d'etre, right? Oh, wait, it is. Right, it is. The, the, the regime in Afghanistan is now using social media to incentivize people to do the things they want and to punish them for doing the things they don't want. We would never have that in America, right? We would never have such control and behavior modification through social media that big tech oligarchs and the establishment would censor the duly elected sitting president, right? We would never have that here. Good grief, man. Before you accuse me, take a look at yourself. Before you accuse me, take a look at yourself. This, there was a tweet going around uh, from, uh, regarding the Taliban, and it said, now, after many years, Afghanistan has been liberated from a regime that forces people to wear facial coverings, destroys statues, and mutilates the genitals of children. Oh, wait a second. Uh-oh. Wait, who is that describing? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not drawing an equivalence here between the li- liberal regime and the Taliban, but I am showing you that there are some commonalities here in that statecraft, in the way that political people use coercion to shape a country in the way that the regimes look at their various constituents, at their various people. And that's a problem because I'm, I'm not saying that America is like Afghanistan, that we're, or that we're the same sort of place. It's no better here than it is there. I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying that we're on a bad trajectory. Okay. And we're going to need to turn things around. And I think men, if, if we had a thriving country, a flourishing country where things were stable and people were free, I suspect there would be little objection to going to Afghanistan or anywhere else and spreading the American vision of society and exerting our influence. But the problem is we can barely keep things together here right now. So you got to build up that country a little bit. We can't even bring our guys back from Afghanistan. We can't even summon the political will to do that. Joe Biden admitted this just yesterday. He was supposed to give a press conference. He was conspicuously late again. Wonder why. I wonder what's going on. Wonder how often Joe is lucid during the day. But he shows up finally and he gives his update on the debacle in Afghanistan. Before I update you on the meeting that I had with the leaders of the G7 earlier today, I want to say a word about the progress we're making on the Build Back Better agenda here at home. I just got off the telephone with the leaders in the House. Today, the House of Representatives has taken significant step toward making a historic investment that's going to transform America, cut taxes for working families, and position the American economy for long-term, long-term growth. Excuse me? The country that we have been occupying for 20 years has now collapsed within a matter of days. The Taliban has stolen all of our military equipment, taken all of our bases. They're now holding Americans hostage behind enemy lines. The United States is already signaling that they will leave those Americans behind. We're all waiting on an update because we haven't really heard very much from Joe Biden on this. And and you're going to open the press conference talking about building back better? Here, you're going to talk about possible tax cuts? I'm sure, I'm sure that for the Americans stuck behind enemy lines, cowering in huts as the Taliban go door to door, knock, 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 where are the Westerners so we can execute you? I'm sure it's going to be a great comfort and consolation that they know that Joe Biden is maybe going to reduce the cost of community college. We're going to build back better. Pre-K has never been so cheap and working families will have a, that's what we all want to hear about, right? right? No, no, of course not. Now, the reason he's opening 
his press conference this way, is he's got nothing on Afghanistan. He's got nothing. He can't, there is not one single thing that he has done in Afghanistan that he can point to and say, this was anything less than a disaster. And so he's got to talk about his plans for lowering the cost of a gender studies degree or whatever. But he's got nothing on Afghanistan. So then he goes out, he talks about this stupid budget thing. And then he says, oh yeah, by the way, in Afghanistan, we're, uh, we've, we were told by the Taliban that we can't get an extension. We're uh, completely giving in to their demands. Uh, we're probably going to, he's, the implication is we're probably going to leave Americans behind enemy lines. Okay, bye. And then he turns around and he leaves and he walks out. Build back better. Turn, turn your back better. Turn the president's back better on reporters from whom he will not answer a single question. Because he can't, because there's no political win there. Jen Psaki was not so lucky. The spokesman at the White House had to go out. Her job is to talk to reporters. And she was pushed on this. Hold on. I thought there were thousands of Americans behind enemy lines. They can't get to the airport. You're refusing to send in the the forces necessary to get them out. So are you saying that we're going to leave Americans in Afghanistan? Answer is yes. Say after the withdrawal, it's done, you know, it's declared, it's done, everyone's out. If one U.S. citizen was suddenly discovered, you know, saying, hey, I really want to get out and I'm stuck, who knows where, somewhere in Afghanistan or in Kabul, he's got any problem, would this trigger a diplomatic, military, or hands on deck type thing to get that person out, whatever the date? Our commitment continues to be to U.S. citizens. If they want to leave, we will help get them out. No matter what the uh, again, we expect there could be some, uh, but I, I don't, I'm not going to get into it further. Well, she, she tried to use this mealy mouth language and it just didn't work. She said, look, we want to get them out. Okay. We, we hope we want to, and if they want to get out, we'll try to help them get out. But it's like, so what do you expect to leave people there? And she says, yes, we do, but I don't want to get into it. I bet you don't want to get into it. I bet you don't. So you're cracking down on our liberties at home. You're cracking down on our, our rights, our tradition, our way of life, upending that entirely. You can see why the people wearing the uh, secular kefia there in the press briefing room, masking up there, not even not allowed to go out, increasingly now not allowed to go to restaurants, not allowed to go to church, not allowed to go to work. So you're going to lock us down here and then you're going to leave us behind overseas. That's, that is what this liberal regime is telling you. Oh, oh, and I'm sorry, there's one third thing that I forgot. We're going to ship all the Afghani people over here. That's what we're going to do. And we're being told that they're being properly vetted, but we've got proof now coming out from the United Kingdom that these people are not being vetted. They can't be. There's too many. A complete dereliction of duty. Now, if you want someone who won't derelict his duty to work for your company, I would strongly recommend you check out ZipRecruiter. I was just in France a few weeks ago. I was over there, I was there for a wedding, and I'm walking around France, and I notice something. There's only about one waiter at every restaurant. <laughs> and it's not just because the French are known for a little leisurely take on, on labor. Uh, no, it's because they can't get workers. If you go to restaurants in America, you go to stores in America right now, you can't get workers. You, I mean, you probably know this with your own company. People have not been working all that much, uh, usually because of lockdowns and mandates over the past year. Now businesses are reopening. It's very hard to find really good talent. Well, if you want to find good talent, go to ZipRecruiter. You post your job on ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter sends that out to a hundred of the top job sites, millions of possible applicants, actively goes out and invites people to apply, finds you the best person. Time is money when it comes to hiring. Hiring is the most important investment you're going to make right now. Try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Canada WLAS. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. With everything going on from the Afghanistan debacle to vaccine mandates, I'm not sure there's a better place to talk about it all than backstage. Join us tomorrow, Thursday, August 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central on DailyWire.com and on our Daily Wire YouTube channel. Don't miss it. Also, today is your last chance to submit your song to be the new Sweet Baby Game Anthem for Matt Walsh's Sweet Baby Gang. Go to dailywire.com slash SBG submissions end tonight at midnight. Go check it out. Also, we've got a great exciting announcement to share today. Deadline Hollywood 
just released the details in an exclusive photo of The Daily Wire's first original movie. It's called Shut In. It's directed by DJ Caruso, executive produced by Daily Wire's co-founders. A production on the thriller wrapped this weekend. It will be available to Daily Wire members beginning in January 2022. This film is centered around a young single mother who is barricaded inside a pantry by her violent ex-boyfriend while using nothing but her voice to guide her two small children to escape escalating danger. It's an intense, suspenseful thriller, delivers riveting action without missing a beat. The trailer for Shut In will be out soon. We know our members are going to love this film. We enter the entertainment space in order to send Hollywood a message that you no longer have a monopoly in the film industry. The release of Shut In is just the next step in proving it. We'll be right back with a lot more. We're getting a report out of the United Kingdom that the supreme vetting of all of our Afghan allies, uh, we know know exactly who's coming in to the West from this war-torn country, which is extremely violent, which has had terrible terrorism problems. We know everyone who's coming in, even though we're airlifting tens of thousands of people at a time, we know exactly who's coming in, except maybe we don't. A person just entered the United Kingdom from Afghanistan who had been on the no-fly list. Now, this person uh, was later not deemed by the UK to be a person of interest in whatever terrorism investigation they're undertaking. But it just shows you the problem. The point of the no-fly list, maybe you support the no-fly list, maybe you don't, but the the premise of the no-fly list, at least, is that people who are considered a threat are not permitted onto airplanes. They're not permitted in. It's uh, good news, I guess, that this person was not considered to be a dangerous enough threat to keep out of the country. But how did that person get on the plane in the first place? Because obviously the Afghan people who are now being flown into this country and others by the tens and hundreds of thousands can't be properly vetted. It's not possible. We're already going to leave Americans in Afghanistan. Americans in Afghanistan. There's no way that you can do a proper vetting to get everybody out. Joe Biden refuses to force the Taliban to extend the deadline to get out. So we're just trying to trying to race against the clock here. We are going to take into just this country possibly 100,000 Afghan refugees. Something tells me they're not all going to be properly vetted. Now, many of them were allies of ours. They helped us out when we were Afghanistan. That, that's great. Thrilled. I appreciate their supporting us. Do we think that not one bad guy is going to make it in there? Do we think that every single person there is going to be just thrilled to join in a Madisonian democracy here? They're, they're all going to just salute the flag and eat apple pie and, and sing the national anthem. Well, frankly, most Americans these days don't sing the national anthem, so I, never mind about that. Do we really think there's no problem here? Because I, the people, the liberal imperialists uh, on the left and the right are telling us that if we in any way raise any questions about taking in any fewer than hundreds of thousands of Afghan migrants, that that is terrible, evil, immoral, un-American. Is that that the case? Can the United States handle that kind of stuff right now? I'm not even talking about the Afghan migrants in particular. I'm just talking about the open borders, taking in the whole world, taking in millions of people a year. Are we really in a good position to handle that? Because as far as I can tell, our national policy has been completely bungled. We've lost our way of life. We're losing our national identity and cohesion. We, I don't even know what the migrants will be assimilated into at this point. What is America? What do we stand for? What are our standards? Doesn't seem like a great idea. Meanwhile, back overseas, we, we've now heard from the Pentagon. They've admitted that the Taliban has stolen all our stuff. They've got all of it. But we, we actually don't know how much they've got. We don't, know, we don't know the stuff that the Afghan army had that the Taliban now took. And in case you were wondering, no, we have no policy solution to fix it. 
Is there any uh, effort to tally up the number of U.S. weapons and equipment that are now under Taliban control? And is there any program to mitigate this problem through destruction or confiscating them back, taking them back? Yeah, Mike, we, I mean, we talked about this uh, before. I don't have an exact inventory of what uh, equipment the, that the Afghans had at their disposal that, that now uh, might be at risk. Obviously, uh, we don't want to see any, um, any weapons or systems uh, that uh, to fall into hands uh, uh, of people that that uh, that would use them in such a way to that that to uh, to harm our interests or those of our uh, our partners and allies. I mean, uh, we have a vested interest, obviously, in in, in not wanting that to happen. Um, but I don't have any policy solutions for you today uh, about uh, how we would uh, or could address that going forward. This, this is embarrassing to watch. This is like when you're in a meeting at your office and there's, there's the flunky guy. There's the flunky guy who, you know, maybe he's a good talker or something, but he, he gets called out or he says, okay, so have you done this thing? Are you doing this thing? What's, what have you, what are you doing? What have you, what have you brought to the company here? And he says, well, uh, yeah, no, I mean, look, obviously, yeah, look, we want to do stuff for our, yeah, for our partners and we want, and synergy, you know, and, but no, we don't, I don't, so what's your solution then, Johnny? Well, no, we don't, I don't have, so I'm not going to, we don't exactly have solutions. Um, but I think it's very important. Look, we, yeah, and I don't know, I don't have like numbers, okay, or um, facts or data or any, but I, yeah, I just think but what's important, we want to have, we want to have that, we, we want to do better and we're going to do better. Right, guys? Right? That's, that's great. I'm glad you want that but we need results. We need, and we're not getting results from our national leaders. We're not getting results on the COVID lockdowns. Not at all. We're getting quite the opposite of that, right? We're, we're not getting results overseas. We're not getting results anywhere. Nowhere. None of the, we're not getting results on immigration. We're not getting results on the economy. We're not getting results on inflation. We're not getting results on anything. So President Trump is deciding to go on the attack. This is probably the strongest evidence yet that Donald Trump plans to run for president again against Joe Biden, if he's even still in office. And we, we wonder if that is even possible. But Trump just released this early on, 2021, a campaign ad, just summing up everything that we've been seeing for the past few months. America is back. Highest inflation rate in the pain US. The southern border is collapsing. The climb of COVID infections. We amplify our power. We summon the new strength. This is a recruitment Should ad. Should we be embarrassed? Diplomacy <laughs> is back. Now the Taliban are back. Kabul is not in an Im imminent threat environment. The likelihood there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. They own the whole country now, the Taliban. The Taliban husband. are now in complete control of Afghanistan. <laughs> complete chaos. How did President Biden get this so wrong? Well, first of all, the mission hasn't failed yet. If this isn't failure, what does failure look like exactly? Biden, you destroyed not Afghanistan, but the world. I don't care if you think I'm Satan reincarnated. <laughs> Do I bear responsibility? Zero responsibility. China is ready for friendly relations with the Taliban. They're just chanting death to America. And you call yourself a president? <laughs> devastating, <laughs> devastating. And, you know, I, I do love that, that voiceover that you hear there from some protesters. You call yourself a president? You should be ashamed. But, but other than that, everything else was just news reports. <laughs> Everything else is just Joe Biden's own words or those of his spokesmen. The, the only editorial part were one or two lines there from you're, you know, you're a bad president or whatever. The rest, it was him indicting himself. And I don't even just mean to blame Biden. Biden has no idea what's going on. It's the whole liberal establishment indicting itself. That, that ad is more powerful than just about any ad I've ever seen in politics. Morning, morning in America, you know, it's sort of Ronald Reagan touting all of his accomplishments. This was like the, 
the flip side of that. This is what happens when everything goes wrong. Now, you're not allowed to say make America great again. I mean, I guess this gets to the heart of our problem. You're not allowed to root for America. You're not, we don't even know what America is. If you, if you say you want to make America great again, if you salute the flag, if you put your hand over your heart when you say the, the pledge, you are, according to the left, engaging in white nationalism. Right? Because America is an evil, rotten, racist, bigoted, terrible, white supremacist place. Uh, here, just take a listen to this voicemail. This voicemail was left on the, the phone of Carter Nordman. He's a representative, state rep in Iowa. This was a woman who, who called him because he supported a bill that would have schools say the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning, just like we all did when we were kids, just like has been true for a lot of American history. She, she got triggered. Yes, this message is for Carter Nordman. My understanding that you are the Iowa State Representative who included language that requires all Iowa schools to lead the Pledge of Allegiance once a day in grades 1 through 12. When did we start teaching white nationalism in schools? Because that's exactly what the f*** you're doing, sir, and you have absolutely no right to require something like that. Our children aren't proud to be American. Maybe the white suburban kids out in Adel are proud to be American because their rights are afforded to them every day and they don't have to fight for them. But for the rest of us who are women, uh, the poor, the elderly, uh, the minorities, we're not so proud. What are we proud of? We're proud of our racist history. We're proud of our racist roots. Is that what we're proud of? We're proud of the fact that not all citizens in the United States are afforded the same rights and the same privileges as the blonde-haired, blue-eyed ones. So, first of all, that woman is the voice of a generation. Before we make fun of her, before we talk about how kooky and crazy she is, she is espousing what is now the mainstream point of view, that if you say anything nice about America or its founding, you are a, a white supremacist, America is an evil place, and we need to undo the founding of the country and refound the country. To, to take away that, that racist, evil, terrible root that's rotten to the core. The second part that's funny about this is that this woman is almost certainly white, right? Because you hear her say, she goes, the, the, maybe it's fine to salute the flag if you're one of those white women in the suburbs, but for the rest of us who are, and then you, you hear there's a little pause. And so if, if she's contrasting the white people with someone else, with herself, she would, if she weren't white, she would probably say, with who are Hispanic, and blah, blah, or who are black and who are, but she doesn't do that. She paused. She goes, yeah, maybe the white people in the suburbs will do that, but not the rest of us who are women. Well, hold on. What, women is not the opposite of white or poor. First, she's, she's not poor. That woman is not. She does not talk like a poor person. She talks like a, a rich, entitled white liberal. <laughs> so she, I, I can hear it. I don't, I'm just, I don't want to rush to conclusions, but you can hear these things. Uh, we, we are oppressed. What would we, what would we be proud of in our country? And that's the question because after decades now of teaching people that there's nothing to enjoy about the country, nothing to be grateful for, nothing of value here, uh, that that's what people believe that, that, uh, we, we have nothing to share to people abroad, which is why now we've got to pull everyone in from outside. But, uh, the country itself is rotten. So we need to bring in as many other people who are not Western, who are not American, uh, to help improve the country. And we need to disrespect our laws as, as best we can because our laws were founded by evil, racist, white supremacist people. There is a logic to their madness. It's, a, it's, a, it's illogic. I mean, it's a, it's a perverse logic, but there is a kind of coherence in its perversity. There is some good news for the American nation. Rare good news that we get these days, especially rare good news from the court. The Supreme Court has, you're probably not hearing about this story, by the way. It's not getting a lot of play. The Supreme Court has just ruled that the Biden administration's attempt to end the remain in Mexico immigration policy uh, is, is not permitted under the law of the land. And so the Supreme Court has refused to block a lower court ruling that will require the government to reinstate the Trump era policy. The remain in Mexico policy was a brilliant policy and it's obviously right and just. The policy is this. We're told that we've got a zillion asylum seekers coming into America. They're not economic migrants. They're not people who just want to flout our laws and come in and make a buck. They are f- 
fleeing political persecution. They'll be killed if they remain in Guatemala or Honduras or El Salvador. And so that's why we've got to let them into America. It's a matter of life or death if they don't get out of their nation of origin. And so the Trump administration said, okay, fine. Uh, if, if people need to come into America to flee death, the political persecution, then, then we'll do that. But if those people make it to another country first, where they'll be perfectly safe, then they've got to stay there. And the reason for this policy is that, of course, these guys who are coming from El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, wherever, have to go through Mexico. So if they were really just fleeing political persecution, they would just stay in Mexico. They'd stay in the first place they could outside of their own country. But they're not. They're economic migrants who want to come here because our economy is better. <laughs> for how long? I don't know. But our economy is theoretically better. And they, they think they're going to have a better life here. And they, they probably would. So Joe Biden comes in and he says, no, forget about that. We can't, we can't have that policy because that's going to discourage people from illegally coming into our country. And that's going to hurt us down the road because we're not going to be able to just bring in voters Ill illegally. So what the Supreme Court did is they actually uh, watched the left get hoisted on its own petard. The, the Supreme Court, when Trump tried to overturn Barack Obama's unconstitutional DACA program, the program that gave executive amnesty to illegal aliens under roughly the age of 40, even though that we, we pretend that they're dreamers who are like six years old, but they're actually much older than that. Uh, the court said, no, you can't do that. You can't, you're actually not permitted to do that. You can't have that kind of capricious policy change left and right because then you won't, you won't be able to have a stable country. So you've got to give a compelling reason. Well, they use that same logic here to stop the Biden administration from reversing the Remain in Mexico policy. Great stuff. Speaking of banning stuff, the founder of OnlyFans, OnlyFans is the, it's like a social media website for porn. You, you can go on to OnlyFans and produce your own pornography, you know, pictures of yourself and stuff like that. I was considering starting my own, you know, just to make a little extra buck. Look, I've got a family now. Okay. I've got to pay some bills. And so you can do that if you're a content creator and then people can subscribe to your porn and they'll get like special porn. You know, even I know it's not exactly difficult to find naked ladies on the internet and you don't have to spend a lot of money to do it, but there is a service now where you can spend money and feel like you've got a special relationship with uh, a pornographer. So OnlyFans announced a week or two ago, that they're going to ban porn from their website, which means their website is basically going to have to shut down. There's no, they, they are a pornography website. So if they ban porn, I'm not sure exactly who's going to be using their website. But they did it, and they, the founder has just explained why. It's because the banks, the big banks, were pressuring them to, because the banks don't want to be involved in this seedy business. They don't want to be funding some pimp whose name is Tim Stokely. He's the CEO of OnlyFans. They don't want to be uh, seen as encouraging 18-year-old girls who want to make a quick buck, who aren't thinking clearly, to go turn themselves into porn stars. And they don't want to encourage this sick addiction among young men. So they say, look, you guys, if you, if you want to keep doing business with us, then you, you got to get all the porn out of there. I think this is great. Okay, there's an, unfortunately, there's a coda to this story, which we'll get to in a second. But at least the first announcement, I think this is great. I know that there are a lot of conservatives out there who are going to say, hold on, Michael, what? You think the banks should be able to exert influence? These are the same banks that are, that are sometimes going after conservatives. These are the same banks who are sometimes wielding power to ostracize conservatives from society. So you can't celebrate when they're wielding power to ostracize pornographers. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And it's this kind of illogic that has really put the right in a bad position over the past couple of decades. Politics is about more than just form. It's also about substance. The fact that banks are doing anything is one aspect of the, of the political question. But what the banks are doing is the other aspect. Like for instance, when, when leftists say, you know, Michael, if, if we tell communists that they can't indoctrinate our third graders in the classroom, if we conservatives were to do that and kick communism out of the classroom, why that would make us no better than the left, which is trying to kick American patriotism out of the classroom. No, no, no. It would make us very different from the left because communism and patriotism are not the same thing. 
our First Amendment rights and pornography are not the same thing. I know that people are confused about this today, but for the vast majority of American history, it was never understood that pornography is protected by the, or obscenity is protected by the First Amendment. But Michael, the banks are going after guns. So now you're fine with them going after pornographers? Yes, because guns and pornography are different. And one is a civil right and one is not. And one is generally illegal. And even though now we don't quite understand that, but yes, those, those are different things. This guy is a pimp. This even dresses like a pimp, Tim Stokely. Now, unfortunately, the, the bad news we just got an hour ago is that the, the OnlyFans has, has reversed course. They've secured funding. They've pressured the banks, whatever. So now they're, they're going to keep pouring out there. This is bad stuff. Conservatives used to be able to recognize that there's a difference between good and bad and right and wrong. I mean, basically the people making the argument that we need to be really worried that a bank pressured OnlyFans to get rid of its porn, even though it didn't really work. They're the ones who are making the same argument that drag queen story hour is a blessing of liberty, like David French made, because they say, well, who's to, who's to say what's good and bad? If, if we get rid of drag queen story hour, why the left might get rid of church on Sunday, which they're already trying to do, by the way. No, we actually, we can know, we can know the difference between these things. Unfortunately, a lot of work to do to, re, to rebuild our society. A lot of work to, forget rebuilding Afghanistan, a lot of work to do to rebuild our society, even on the right, for us to make sense of these things. Much more to say. We'll have to hold it for tomorrow. I'm Michael Knowles. This is the Michael Knowles Show. See you then. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Nika Geneva. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. On The Matt Wall Show, we talk about the things that matter. Real issues that affect you, your family, our country. Not just politics, but culture, faith, current events, all the fundamentals. If they matter to you, come check out the show. 